Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Good evening. My name is uh, Tony Harris, and I've been a Master Cobb County Master Gardener since uh, 2010. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and also a Cherokee elder. I grew up in Oklahoma using many of these plants. Uh, in fact, my mother practiced plant medicine on me when I was growing up. So I'm very familiar not with these uh, plants and have always had an interest in it. Someone asked me um, why I wanted to put so much time into developing a Cherokee Garden at uh, Green Meadows Preserve, which is located at uh, 3180 Dallas Highway in Marietta. And I said, I came to the realization that culture and knowledge was only one generation away from being lost. And I was not willing to see that happen. And so we have put together a collection of uh, plants uh, the Cherokees used for medicine, for food, clothing, shelter, uh, arts and crafts, ceremonial purposes prior to the Trail of Tears. Uh, this particular uh, garden is also an interpretive site on the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. I'm also a president of the Georgia Trail of Tears Association. I have such a passion for wanting to maintain this culture and heritage that uh, it's what drives us uh, to put in the hours that we have in the last four and a half years. With other master gardeners, we've had over 4,000 volunteer hours in developing this garden. I call this presentation Ethnobotany, If Plants Could Talk, A Cherokee Relationship. This is something that you have to understand that the Cherokees relied on these plants for survival, not for just a, a hundreds of years, but thousands of years. And uh, they believe that the Creator gave them everything they needed to sustain life and to and to have medicines. All they had to do is discover how to use it. And so over the thousands of years, they have come up with uh, plant knowledge, like on medicine. I've already uh, identified over 500 plants the Cherokees use just for medicine. And the way they changed plants in the medicine is what I want to talk about first. The first way they would do that is that they would make a, what's called a decoction. That's where the plant material is placed in a large amount of water, which is then partially boiled away. And then that water that's left is used as a medicine and or tonic. Then they would also make what's known as a steep or an infusion. That's where the plant material is shredded or pounded and soaked in cold water. Then they would make what's known as a poultice. And a poultice is where they would take plant material that's prepared in different ways, wrap it in cloth, normally dampen it, and then apply it to uh, the spot that needs to be treated. And they would also boil uh, plant material for a short time in water versus the uh, uh, decoction uh, or steep infusion. <clears throat> but they took a good bit of their uh, medicine in the form of tea. In most cases, they would drink that tea, but sometimes it was applied to an ailing spot. In some cases, they would take, uh, if something was wrong in the skin, they would take a sharp object like the thorns of a devil's balky stick and scratch the skin and then pour that tea on the scratches to help it penetrate uh, uh, down in, into the uh, skin. The first plant I want to talk about tonight is bloodroot. And um, bloodroot is is very uh, uh, unique, a beautiful plant. Um, it flower, its flowers are pollinated by flies and bees. And the seeds ripen before the foliage goes dormant. And they have an organ called <clears throat> elasosome, which uh, ants love to eat. It's kind of a, a, an orange, yeah, orangey yellow color. And they would take these seeds down into their colonies or the, the, the ground that's been softened. And they would eat this coating off of the seed. It didn't hurt the seed. But what they did is they actually planted the seed in very loose soil. And it just so happens that uh, they, they, the seeds were also uh, nourished by the waste given off from the ants. And then all that was necessary is rainwater uh, to uh, have these uh, uh, blood roots colonize. And, and they did that very easily. The uh, roots were used uh, as a basket and clothing dye. And that's important because the Cherokees 
uh, uh, had a uh, a meaning for every color, and red was a sign of success, and that's the reason why so much of the uh, chief's clothing and so much of the artwork is in red because it is a sign of uh, success. Now you can take the root of the blood root and break it open and, and when that juice comes in contact with air it turns blood red and it's a dye and so uh, the Cherokees would use that as a dye as well but they'd also use that uh, that as a, a cough medicine and and to treat eye ailments. But it's unusual is that uh, it, they would also treat poison ivy with it. We had a master gardener in our group that uh, got into some poison ivy on our work day one day and had some streak up her forearms there. And I said, well, come here. So we went over to the blood root and I broke that open and rubbed that on uh, those red streaks. And I said, now leave that on today and then tonight, uh, wash that off. And so the next week when I saw her, I said, how did that work? She said, you know, uh, when I washed that off, the red streaks were gone. There was nothing there. And I said, well, it worked. And also the tubers were used as an insect repellent. It's a very effective insect repellent. So you can imagine as the Cherokees were foraging around in the woods, that uh, both uh, poison ivy and also insect repellent was uh, important. It likes uh, moist, well-drained soils and part to full shade. And this, the sanquinarin uh, is an antiseptic that this plant has that was used to uh, uh, as an antiseptic for uh, warts or poison ivy or whatever. The next plant I want to talk about is mayapple. And mayapple is, um, uh, is a, a plant that goes by several different common names. It's also known as hog apple or Indian apple, uh, uh, mayflower, and even umbrella plant because of the shape of the leaves. It, it, it's, uh, it looks kind of like an umbrella. But the flowers provide the sexual reproduction for this plant and the rhizomes provide asexual reproduction and dispersal and, and cluster growth. <clears throat> now the Cherokees would use this plant to promote vomiting. And that was one way they had of cleansing the body of impurities. And, uh, but they would use it to promote vomiting. And they'd also use it as a stool softener and it's also, a, they use it for as a treatment for worms. Now they didn't use the root joints or the leaf joints because they were poisonous. Uh, but the parts of the roots between the joints was what was used for medicine. Now the flowers from a fork in the stem form the uh, may apple, which uh, ripens in uh, July and August. Okay, the next plant is uh, wild ginger. And uh, wild ginger is important because uh, it uh, is used in so many Cherokee medicinal formulas. Now, one of the things that's unique about the Cherokee language, uh, when the Cherokees would name a plant, they wouldn't use one or two words like the Europeans used. They would, all, they would also use, they would use descriptive phrases. So the Cherokee name for this plant translated means the mule's footprint or big stretch. And the reason for that is that if a, a mule were to stick their hoof in mud and pull it back out, the imprint that was left in the mud would be the same shape as the leaf on this plant. So every Cherokee knew uh, the mule's footprint was uh, wild ginger. It was used in at least 80% of all the Cherokee medicinal formulas. Now it's not like the Cherokees would take a plant and make a medicine. Oftentimes it was a combination of two, three or four different plants. So 
I, I said I've identified over 500 they use just for medicine. You can see how complex that can become. And that's the reason why uh, it takes anywhere from 15 to 20 years to become a, a competent medicine man or medicine woman. And that's also the reason why it oftentimes runs in family because the children can be exposed to it and they pick up on it and, and carry that on as a uh, legacy. But the wild ginger is used for indigestion and as a kidney medicine and a tonic for endurance for the upcoming harvest to give them stamina. You know, as I uh, do presentations on these uh, medicinal plants, and I say, okay, the Cherokees use this to, as a treatment for kidney, uh, kidneys, or they use this plant for high blood pressure or whatever. Uh, people ask me, how do they know they had that? But what you uh, need to remember is that even today, I would say 40% of the Cherokees in the Cherokee Nation still practice plant medicine. Some of them will go to a regular doctor as a last resort. So this is not, this is not a, a, a dead knowledge. This is something that's still being practiced today and, and is handed down through hundreds and thousands of years. The wild onion, the allium. <laughs> And uh, it's in the lily family and can be added to any food. Now, I was doing a presentation one time and uh, this person uh, said, listen, the only thing I've ever sauteed wild onions in is Roundup, but it actually is a very uh, good food. You only eat the dark green parts of the top of the, of the, of the plant. Normally the best time to to uh, 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 crop it is in April and May. I, I call it a stronger version of chives. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up, the stores in the Cherokee Nation, you could go into uh, the produce department and they would, they would be selling clumps of, uh, of uh, wild, uh, wild onions like you would uh, buy clumps of chives. Now my mother would scramble uh, these uh, wild onions and eggs, and it was very tasty. Uh, they're eaten annually by the Cherokees, and uh, they made a tonic out of these to, to help clean the system out. In fact, there's a festival. Um, you could, if you want to know more about the wild onion, you can Google Wild Onion Festival Oklahoma, and it'll tell you about how not only the Cherokees use the wild onion, but also other Native American tribes as well. And it's, it's a big uh, uh, festival and they even have a Miss Wild Onion. And uh, it's uh, pretty competitive for that because the winner uh, gets a, uh, a college scholarship, a four year college scholarship. So uh, the uh, competition for it is very serious. Now you have to remove the shuck, that's the white portion. If you pull this out of the ground, it's all of the white portion of the wild onion on the bottom because that is very uh, uh, tough and it's not tasty, it's not really edible. Now they would make a, a tonic out of this that treats uh, colic and croup and hives and colds, uh, sore throats and even liver complaints. And like I say, it's harvested in April and May. The black walnut, the Jugla nigra, and um, an infusion of the inner bark was taken for smallpox. And this is significant in that uh, one of the things the Europeans brought to uh, America, North America, uh, was not only themselves, but they brought diseases that uh, uh, the Cherokees and other native tribes had no resistance to. And one of those was smallpox. 
In fact, uh, before the Trelateers in 1838 and 1839, there were two major outbreaks of smallpox. Each time it killed half of the living Cherokees. So they had to find ways to treat uh, smallpox. And one of the ways is that they would have an infusion of the inner bark is taken for the, uh, to treat smallpox. The bark is used cautiously because it is poisonous. And, but uh, they, the Cherokees would chew that bark for toothaches. And the sap uh, on the inner bark was used as an antiseptic for things like uh, ringworms. And a poultice, remember a poultice is uh, where you take a, a cloth. They would take the black husk off of the walnuts, put it inside that uh, uh, cloth, dampen it, and then they would uh, apply that to a newborn baby's belly button to promote it, uh, the umbilical cord uh, dropping off. Of course, the nuts were used as food. I love black walnuts. Now, <clears throat> the black husks were also used to make uh, dark brown dye. Now, if you've ever uh, taken a, a black walnut and barehanded shuck the black off, that black, you can't wash that off. It's a dye. But the Cherokees would use that as a, a dark brown dye. <clears throat> now, they used the leaves to make a green dye. But they also fished with the black walnut. They would take the black husk off of the uh, uh, walnuts and place those in a container, pour water over it, and basically let it ferment. Then they would go out to a stream or a river where they knew there were fish, but not a lot of current. And they would dump that slurry into the water and it temporarily shocks the fish. It's like telephoning the fish and the fish come floating to the top and they would either net them and throw them out of the bank or gig them and throw them out on the bank. Now the Cherokees never wasted anything. What they didn't eat that day, they would take back to their uh, uh, cabins and, and put it in their smokehouses so they could preserve it for future use. You can do the same thing the Cherokees could do the same thing with uh, the uh, roots of, of the uh, um, buckeye. buckeye, the roots of the buckeye. And uh, you just take the uh, roots for the buckeye and chop them up and put them like in a burlap sack. And uh, it will do the same thing. It'll, it'll shock the fish. It doesn't poison them. Uh, both of those are highly illegal, but uh, they it's called uh, uh, actually... Uh, cropping the fish or harvesting the fish. Now you see in this picture, a, a Cherokee fish trap. And what that is, the Cherokees uh, would take rocks and make a V shape in the water. And that would force the fish down into the small portion of that V where they could then net them or gig them and take them out. Cherokees ate a lot of fish. In fact, many of their villages and and homes were next to streams or, or water because that was a that was a year-round source of protein so uh, it was something that they relied on uh, uh, they ate a lot of fish they made gigs from the wood because it's very hard and uh, but uh, black walnuts emit a, a substance called juglone you never want to plant a vegetable garden next to a black walnut because it'll kill tomatoes and apples and potatoes and it'll, it'll decimate a, a vegetable garden. Uh, the trees like full sun and moist, well-drained soils and can reach 130 feet tall. And black walnuts can live as long as 250 years. By the way, this, this fish trap you see in that picture, there's still three or four of those on the Chattahoochee River. And so uh, uh, they're... Uh, they were very effective uh, to uh, lure fish in. Okay, the next plant I want to talk about is sweet everlasting. Some people refer to that as rabbit tobacco, but the pseudonaphilium obtusifolium. And, and again, the descriptive name for this plant 
in Cherokee translates ash-like. And the reason for that is if you look at the aerial parts of this plant, the stems, the flowers, everything is ashen in color. Uh, we have um, a lot of this growing in the meadows at uh, Green Meadows Preserve. And uh, it's, uh, the, the, the Cherokees would make a tea from the aerial parts of the plant and used to treat uh, uh, flu and colds. And they would even make uh, uh, teas and drink that as a preventative before the flu and cold season started. But it, they would have a cold infusion uh, to use as a skin astringent. And uh, very effective uh, for that, even more so than witch hazel. Now the tops, were used indoors as air fresheners. When they bloom, they're very fragrant. And they would take these into their Cherokee cabins and use them as an air freshener. And it would last for two or three months. I guess that's one of the reasons it's got its name, uh, Sweet Everlasting. It grows in full sun and often found in meadows, which it certainly is at uh, Green Meadows. Now the next plant is the seven bark hydrangea the hydrangea arborescence. And um, the inner bark of this uh, tea was used to, for, uh, to treat vomiting in children. If they had a problem with vomiting, they would make that uh, tea from the inner bark to treat that and, and cause it to stop. Now they'd make a bark poultice. Again, that would, they would wrap the, the bark in a, in a cloth. Uh, and dampen it and to put on sore or swollen muscles. And a poultice of the scrap bark was used to treat burns. And the bark was chewed for stomach trouble and high blood pressure. And a tea from the inner bark and the leaves was used as a stimulant. Now it's found in moist uh, soil under a forest canopy or close to streams. This picture was taken uh, in the lower garden of, of our residence in a, in a dapple uh, sunlight. And it's, you can tell it's very, very happy there. The blooms on this uh, are just incredible. They're so tiny and white, uh, like little pearls. And uh, it's just a, a magnificent plant. Now the, the stem bark turns uh, to peel off in several layers and colors, uh, hence the name, the seven bark uh, hydrangea. And of course, we all know our resin simply means becoming tree-like because as it ages, it becomes more woody. Rattlesnake master. And uh, rattlesnake master is in the parsley family. Now there's a couple of varieties here in Georgia. There's the aquafolium, which is found along the, uh, the Georgia coastline. And then there's the uh, yuccafolium, which is found in North Georgia. And that would be the variety that the Cherokees uh, related to. It's a perennial that grows about uh, uh, three feet tall. We've got a, a great stand of this at the Cherokee Garden. Now here, the Cherokee name for this plant translates, it means a little base of mother corn that encompasses all. And you say, what does that mean? Well, the base, mother corn, they also, the, the Cherokees often refer to corn as mother corn, but a little base of that, if you'll notice the, the leaves on this plant look very similar to the leaves on corn. So it's a little base of mother corn that encompasses the entire plant. So that was their descriptive name uh, for this plant. It was called a warrior's plant and also a survival kit. Now, the hunters uh, would carry this button root on their person as a protection in the woods because they believed that if they came across a snake, it would crawl away from them. On the other hand, uh, if they suffered a snake bite, they would take this uh, button root and chew it up, swallow half of that, and then apply the other half to the snake bite as a snake bite uh, remedy. 
The root tentacles are also known to inhibit cancer. And the blossoms, this, uh, when it blooms, it has a, a shoot that comes up, oh, two or three feet with beautiful blossoms on it. And those blossoms were used, again, uh, in a poultice, uh, moistened uh, to uh, promote uh, the uh, umbilical cord dropping off of newborn babies. The maple leaf viburnum. <clears throat> A, com a compound infusion was taken for smallpox. Again, here's another plant the Cherokees found to use to treat smallpox. And the Cherokees shared their medicinal knowledge with the Europeans because they didn't have any medicine at all. And so uh, the Cherokees shared that with them. The bark root uh, tea uh, was taken, it promoted sweating, which is what you wanted to do if you had smallpox, you wanted to promote sweating. But it also uh, reduced fever, which is another uh, of the ailments associated with smallpox. But then it also uh, uh, helped to prevent muscle spasm. So this tea treated three different symptoms of of uh, smallpox and the Cherokees uh, uh, learned this and shared it with the uh, Europeans. Now the fruit on this particular plant uh, are called droops. And uh, uh, a lot of times uh, the fruits on plants you'll notice are like very like or round. Well, these droops are about a quarter of an inch long. They're uh, purple black and they're shaped like a pear. And thus they call it uh, droops, but that is the fruit that's on the, uh, this plant. It grows three to six feet tall. It tolerates full sun to park shade. We rescued this plant right here, uh, uh, just north of uh, uh, Cartersville. And uh, it likes uh, medium and, uh, uh, and well-drained soils. This is pictured in our lower garden. It's on a bank. And so it doesn't like saturated wet feet, but it likes the medium moisture and well-drained soil. So it's very happy there. Sunchoke. Some people call this Jerusalem artichoke. And uh, this is pictured from the corner of our house where we, we've got this uh, uh, growing uh, in the, It'll get six, seven feet tall and have a beautiful bloom on it. But uh, the tubers, uh, the Cherokees ate the tubers and the tubers uh, look very similar to ginger roots. They're, they're odd shaped, kind of funny shape. But uh, the Cherokees uh, used these like you would potatoes. They were harvested in the spring and the fall and uh, could be eaten raw, boiled, or in soup. And <clears throat> the raw texture, uh, the texture and taste is almost identical to water chestnuts. In fact, my wife and I would harvest these and, and chop them up, clean them and chop them up and use them in stir fry. They're quite tasty. The Cherokees cultivated these in mass. I mean, fields, large fields of these as far back as 1500 AD. And this was something that they could, uh, they could uh, harvest and store and have during the uh, uh, winter months because the tubers are about 10% protein and 76% carbohydrates. You know, uh, I have a blog that I'm gonna talk about a little later. It's called mycherokeegarden.com. And uh, when I started it, I didn't realize how far things went when you put them on the internet. But oh, it's been four or five months ago, I did a, a, a posting on a Sunchoke. And uh, about an hour later, I get a response from a lady in Hanoi, Vietnam, who was a, a, a chef. And she wanted to know more about uh, how the Cherokees used other plants for food. And today, Today, in big name restaurants in the U.S., this sunchoke or Jerusalem artichoke is the cat's meow. 
I mean, it is, it goes for big bucks if they make the soup or however they, uh, they uh, fix it. But it's, it is really one of the hot uh, things in big name restaurants in America today. But they can be invasive. That's the only thing you have to uh, remember. The Eastern Red Cedar. Now, the Eastern Red Cedar has more of a spiritual connotation to the Cherokees. The elders would use it in purification uh, processes or purposes, and th they would take the leaves and set them on fire and burn them. And the smoke was used very much like you would uh, incense to help convey requests and prayers. But the smell was very much like a juniper oil. Uh, it is a juniper, it's not a true cedar. And the oldest tree that they found here in the US is in Missouri and they estimate it to be about 795 years old. So it's a very long lived uh, tree. Now the Cherokees would take uh, and make poles out of some of the limbs on this tree to uh, mark agreed upon hunting territories. They would respect each other's territory where they hunted. And when uh, another Cherokee would see the cedar uh, poles, they would know that was someone else's hunting territory and respect it. The cones were used to make a kidney medicine and tobacco. Nicotiana rustica and this is unique in that this is actually an Aztec tobacco. And you said, well, how, would, how did the Cherokees uh, end up with this? But you have to remember for hundreds and hundreds of years, there were trade routes from Central America up into what is now North America. And um, uh, this was one of the plants that was brought up that the Cherokees adopted uh, in fact, it's one of the uh, seven sacred plants. And, uh, but it was forbidden to smoke it. You wouldn't want to. Regular tobacco has about a 3% nicotine content. The nicotine rustica is 9%. Now, I'm good friends with uh, the director of natural resources for the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. And we trade plants back and forth. And he told me one day, he said, uh, uh, I found uh, two or three of the uh, brown leaves uh, dried and I put those in my mouth and started chewing on them and the whole world started to turn. And he said, I stopped and then I was spitting yellow all day. And he said, uh, not again, <laughs> but the smoke was used to, uh, to convey requests and prayers, just like the uh, cedar was used. Totally different fragrance. Now, Hunters would carry ground up leaves in a pouch on their person when they were hunting because they, they felt like that uh, their prayers or requests were, uh, were heard, better heard if they had that on their person. The Cherokees were very religious people and for, for the most part were monotheistic, which means they believed in one God, the creator, and they call him Unethelana. So uh, when the German or Moravian Christians came over uh, and had missions among the Cherokees prior to the Trilliteers, um, uh, they uh, thought they were gonna teach the Cherokees German and convert them to Christianity, but they found out the Cherokees had their own language, their own printing press, and they had to learn Cherokee in order to relate to them. And, um, uh, so at the time of the Trilliteers, it was easy for the Cherokees being monotheistic to pick up on Christianity. So it was estimated at the time of the Trilliteers that 80% of the Cherokees uh, were Christian. It's easy to grow. And believe it or not, it's closely related to tomatoes. Beautiful plant. Prairie willow. And prairie willow is Silex humulus. And uh, we have uh, this growing in the Cherokee Garden. 
And this, I'd venture to say, is the only specimen of this plant in the southeastern United States. Uh, there's one county in Tennessee and one county in Kentucky where at one time you used to be able to find it. My friend, uh, the director of natural resources, uh, looked uh, for seven or eight years in the Cherokee Nation before he found this. And I finally talked him out of some of it. But uh, uh, the Cherokee name for this is Red Root. But they're all, they also had, the Cherokees also had stories about this plant. They, they call it the plant that walks. And the reason for that is that it has aggressive rhizome roots. So it could be growing here this year, but may come up additionally over here uh, uh, next year. So to get from here to there, it had to walk. <clears throat> it was used in stomp ground activities. The tea was made from the leaves to treat the fever, colds, pains, flu, whatever, since 1700. Now you can take you can take three or four of these leaves and put them in your mouth and start chewing them. And it's like taking a shot of Novocaine. And so the Cherokees would treat toothaches with this. But uh, this tea that they made uh, to treat uh, for aches and pains and so forth was something that um, uh, eventually, I guess in the, in the 1860s, there was a little German company that started studying the willow and uh, synthesized what was naturally taking place in the plant and developed a product called aspirin, a salicylic acid. And that's the reason some people can't take aspirin on their stomach, it's acidic. But the Cherokees were using it correctly and uh, now the Cherokees would also make uh, a, a cold infusion of the bark to wash their hair in to promote hair growth. Now, I realized when I got this plant, and it's very healthy, it's about uh, four and a half, five feet tall, bushy, has those willow leaves, but I have the male version. <laughs> and so the next time uh, I go to Oklahoma, I'm going to sit down with Pat Gwynn, the director of natural resources, and talk him out of a female specimen uh, uh, to go with this because they do so much better if you have both of them uh, growing side by side. Beautiful plant, very rare, very rare. <clears throat> so, anytime you have uh, uh, any skin cream, if you have a medicated skin cream, if you look at the ingredients, and if it says salicylic acid, that, that, that skin cream is a topical aspirin, and that's what makes it medicinal. Okay, the shagbark hickory. The shagbark hickory was used for bows and tools and furniture and stickball sticks. Uh, but it was, the, it was the wood of choice in smokehouses because it, it burned low and slow and gave off such a, a, an incredible smoke that uh, the meats, anything smoked in the smokehouse was just delicious. The Cherokees also uh, made a hickory syrup, which I, I have some of uh, at home. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a lighter color, sweet. Uh, they would use it uh, with wild berries and so forth to make jams and jellies. But uh, they would also, the, the nuts from the shagbark hickory are very oily. So the women would take those and crush those nuts uh, for the cooking oil and use that oil to cook with. Uh, now the nuts are called soy. It's used uh, to make a paste. Uh, uh, food similar to uh, what Hawaiians would call poi. And uh, the inner bark makes a tea used to treat colds and fever. Now the shaggy bark hangs from the tree trunk, but not all the time. When the shag bark hickory is younger, uh, depending on the acidity and the soil and so forth, uh, it may be uh, seven, eight, nine years before they develop this shaggy bark. In the meantime, it's a smooth bark. So how do you tell a shagbark hickory 
a, a younger shagbark hickory from just another hickory. And the way you do that is if you look at this leaf on the, on the bottom here, uh, a, a shagbark hickory each uh, uh, has five leaflets on each leaf. And that's how you tell if you've got a shagbark hickory or not. Now, I'm helping the Cherokee Nation in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, that, that's the Cherokee capital, uh, develop a, a garden out there. So we're developing a, a garden on both ends of the Trail of Tears. And this is a picture of Pat Gwynn taking some people through uh, the, the Cherokee garden there. And uh, uh, this is a picture of uh, Feather. Uh, Feather Smith is one of the caretakers at the garden there. And uh, it's, it's interesting that one of the plants that they wanted out there, about a third of the plants the Cherokees used uh, back east are not readily available in Northeast Oklahoma, the 13 counties in Northeast Oklahoma, which is a Cherokee nation, even though the planting zones are very close together. Uh, in fact, uh, Tahlequah, you'd swear you were in North Georgia, it's the foothills of the Ozarks. But we took, we took a tulip poplar, which actually is a state tree of Tennessee as well. And it, it was small enough to where we could put it in the back of our Sienna van standing up. And that was about four or five years ago. And uh, they said, where, where should we plant? I said, you need to plant it by this brook that's going through the, the garden there. And so we were back about five years later and I was walking through the garden with Feather. And she said, uh, Tony, how big does this tree get? And I said, Feather, it's going to be bigger than anything in the Cherokee Nation. And uh, because it's, at that time, it's about 25 foot tall. But the Cherokees would make canoes out of the trunks because we were big and straight. But they would also uh, make long uh, timbers for log cabins. Uh, it's actually a more durable wood than, than oak for uh, building log cabins. And they could get bigger and longer beams out of it. This Tahlequah uh, garden is located at the tribal complex in what they call Salagi. And as I said, about a third of the plants that use are not readily available out there. They tell us what they want and we, we take them out there. And the purpose here is the purpose for the garden. The purpose in Tahlequah is the same purpose for the garden here uh, in Cobb County, is to preserve and promote the history and culture of the Cherokee and what they depended on for survival. You know, for more information, I had mentioned earlier in my blog, you can simply go to mycherokeegarden.com and I use WordPress so you can communicate back with me. And uh, I talk about all of these plants, uh, how the Cherokees used them uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and different aspects of what the, uh, the plants uh, were as well. It'll also give you a picture of the plant because some of these plants go dormant during the growing season, but it, it shows the importance of the Cherokee native plants and um, the, the growing conditions if you wanted to use some of those. Thank you, Tony. That was really interesting, fascinating, and all that kind of good stuff, historical as, as well. Um, a little more insight into the um, centuries of horticulture. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.